our next speaker. He is J.M. Aronson, who is a sys senior systems engineer for Software AG. He's a business process architect, methodology specialist, and transforming engineering lead with over 15 years of experience. JM has consulted for clients across industries, including the public sector, retail, utilities, manufacturing, lottery and gaming, telecom, and oil and gas. He helps his clients develop and implement business process frameworks, hone process-centric strategies, and execute process improvement and architecture modernization projects. JM, it's an honor and pleasure to have you here with us. You always bring tremendous insights to our global community. And on top of that, you're all around good guy. Just a pleasure Aww. to be with and a great smile, a great positive attitude in everything that you do. And it's a real gift for all of us to have you presenting today. Well, thank you so much, Jose. And I, I felt like saying at the beginning, oh, yeah, J.M. Merlin's in from Toronto, Canada in the chat. I, <laughs> yes. I'm glad That's to hear right. we've got so many people from around the world. We have two great industry and thought leaders in process mining coming from Canada today. You I with know. And we have Bill Wong, who is a, 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 an AI uh, expert and data science leader, also based in Toronto. Uh, clearly, Toronto has like this oh, yeah. great cluster of great minds. Well, we like to think of ourselves as Silicon Valley North, but maybe we've also got uh, <laughs> a couple of folks here to back that up. Well, Bill, Bill and I are going to have to connect later, uh, grab a, grab a right. bite That's in right. uh, one of Toronto's wonderful restaurants. Well, folks, uh, I want to get started here. Uh, Jose, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and I want to get started with uh, talking about something that I, I care quite a lot about. And hopefully, after this presentation, you will too. Um, my session today is called Process, Min Process and Task Mining, Hybridizing Solutions to Harmonize Insights for a very important reason. Um, I see these two things as, as separate but important and interlocked components of understanding and getting insight into your business, how it works, and ultimately how it's performing, um, and being able to understand where to go next and who to look to to transform and improve your operations. I understand that there's a transformational journey that a lot of people are on, um, and prior to coming to these sessions and thinking about process mining, you might have been stuck in the top area, this sort of gray design, implement, execute, design, implement, execute. Um, this is where a lot of organizations kind of get stuck because they've got people trying to do their work, documenting processes, creating deliverables, but they're not really creating a lot of value for the organization, they're kind of satisfying requirements at very minimum. They're keeping the lights on. And when you start to take a look at the, uh, the thing on the right side, when you get this execution data collected, that means what you're doing is starting to take lessons learned back from the way in which your business actually operates. And highlighted in green there is where process and task mining starts to come in. It starts to provide actual data on how things are operating and give you insights on how to improve them. And they're both part of this puzzle. We're going to get into that as we, as we talk about what they are and a, a real practical example of what we do with them. From those process and mining and task mining insights, what do you do next? We'll, look to, we'll take a look at an example of what we did today, but at a high level, we want to under, understand where things are going wrong, be able to simulate the impact of changes should you address those issues, and be able to approve, govern, and check back on how task and process mining is being implemented in an automation or in a business process transformation, or ultimately just in, in better learning and development for the people, because that's what you've got operating and executing your processes. We understand that process and task mining are a pretty key part of a lot of your worlds, which is why you're here today, because you want to optimize your processes. You want to achieve process excellence. You also want to understand whether or not people are doing what you said they should do, um, whether or not different business units are, are behaving differently and actually performing differently, and get conformance on those process executions. And then you want to digitize your business, be able to under, understand where you can automate, how you can use technology to improve. Your, your operations and using things like RPA, using things like a further level of automation, different types of business rules uh, implemented, you can really achieve high value transformations with simply using data as your feeder. Now, what is process discovery when we talk about process mining? Because I'm gonna go talk about both of these things in tandem and it's important to recognize each is separate, but they dovetail together. On the bottom, you're gonna see, we're gonna hit process mining as source systems, pulling a bunch of sets of activities. You think of these as your data points that you're going to mine out. These are activities that occurred within those transactional systems that you're pulling the information from that we're going to parse and align 
to what they happened in context of. So these are steps that happened as one person was doing an order. This is these are steps that are part of the hire to retire process for a single employee. And once we've aligned them to what happened, we can time code them and sort them into the order in which they occurred, allowing us to understand the flow of information. Now, if this is new to you, welcome to Process Mining Live. <laughs> if this is not new to you, um, then you're obviously an experienced practitioner, but I want you to note very carefully where our data all came from, kind of source systems we had. We're looking at transactional data pulled from data spaces, data lakes, data, you know, available tables, uh, connections into databases. We're pulling elements of measured by system transactions. We'll get to that in a second. But now, what do you do with task mining? What is what is task mining conversely? Here, you've got a bunch of different machines of individual executors in your organization and each of them are doing processes. Those processes are on the desktop and they're using systems that wouldn't necessarily capture automated transactions normally. They would be you know, Excel, Word, Outlook, all those different manual, if you can call it manual, I suppose, but they're, they're manual programs, things that don't have a transactional bend to them. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a visualization of those individual user actions based on screen scraping, based on click and key logging. Well, that, what that allows us to do is understand what did person A do on day B to execute process C? What did they click? What did they type? What did they do and to be able to achieve those business goals? But we're seeing and collecting this data and grabbing it into a log, unlike the transactional log we saw before from a, from a system where it's all controlled by the parameters of the automation, we are controlling them by the parameters of the parser. So the task miner is helping to understand and consolidate these actions into a recognizable process flow. It's also entirely based on individual user action, which allows us to see a different level of insight as in what you happening, what's happening on the desktop, but it doesn't give us a, a view into anything else. It just tells us what, where did you click? Did you go do your taxes? <laughs> I'm kidding, of course, we put data masking on all this stuff. But comparing these two things together, process mining allows us to capture those transactional automated steps, displays key attributes captured by those systems. So for instance, there's a lot of information we can capture that systems themselves capture. Um, things like financial data, things like order quantities or volumes. We call those measures and dimensions, as, as in things we can segment our process by, a dimension as in a business unit area or a type of order or priority of the order, and, and measures being quantities and values that we can calculate on. However, this really only sees our transactions. This only sees what our system sees. So, and this is actually, the process mining obviously isn't very new, um, this is a, but this is a weakness of this whole philosophy, is you can only ever see what your system sees. And in some ways, that's great, because your system sees a lot of things, particularly if you're a very heavily automated shop, or you're on an ERP system that is built to control and manage everything you do, that's great, but it doesn't explain what, what I talk about is suspicious activities very well. Task mining, on the other hand, has been revolutionized to capture activities on the desktop, aggregated over a user, understanding the variances and task running of your, pre your particular process by a user. However, this only ever sees a user action. So if a user doesn't click or type somewhere on their screen during the period of capture of your robotic process discovery bot, it doesn't exist in the system. Well, that, that seems to miss a few of the things we're talking about. As you might imagine, there's a lot of the business that is not done at the desktop level. There are transactions, there's automations that ensure that the, the processes run in the background or in the back and behind the scenes. They also move from user to user dynamically as you go through an end-to-end -end handoff. When you only see user actions, you have to start thinking, doing things like stitching them together by users. It becomes a, a limiting factor of task mining. What I argue for today and what you should be taking a look at and thinking about is the hybridizing of these two, two solutions to harmonize the insights that they provide. Process mining, providing you an understanding of the automations and how they run and the steps that are being done underneath it. Task mining, helping you to understand the individual user actions in order to achieve those steps, helping you to focus in on those suspicious automated steps that really aren't so automated and be able to see exactly where you can focus your efforts to improve, not just by re-automated you know, re systems, but also 
by learning and development, by individual user support and performance enhancement, things like robotic process automation that can help on the desktop level to solve some of those suspicious problems we see in the transactional level. It's not all about doing our system re-implementation because that's expensive, time consuming, and often not even the right thing to do. And we see this all come together in a technical life cycle that, we, that we've, you know, we've really honed, developed, and implement, implemented uh, here at Software AG for, for a bunch of our clients, but I, I'm gonna go through an example today as well. On the left side, you're seeing the discover and analyze, this duality of things. Discover and analyze being, we discover the processes that are executed in systems, we analyze the user actions that are happening on a desktop level, and we bring those together into a design environment. Now, I see these as two levels of hierarchy. The discovered process being a higher level model, the process model, what is your automation? The in analysis, the analyze level being our sub-processes. What is an individual user doing underneath each one of these little boxes in your model? And when I say in your model, I do mean in your model. I would always recommend for you to take any insights you've gathered from process mining or task mining and put it into a modeling platform. Why a modeling platform? I'm just trying to gather insight. Well, the answer is you're not. You're actually trying to make a change. You're trying to effect change on the business. And if all you have is a system throwing up a red flag and saying, something's broken, then all you're gonna get is people complaining at you. What you want is you want to be able to do something about it. You want to remodel, you want to design, develop the next way of executing your processes, either at the system level through re-automation through re or at the user level through learning and development, trainings and uh, through RPA and developing solutions that you can use at each of these levels, put them together to solve the problem that you have found. And then when you deploy and operate, you also always wanna check back. I talked about this at the beginning, but it's a really important part of the puzzle. A lot of organizations tend to invest money and in sort of uh, invest is a strong word. They tend to throw money <laughs> at a technology in order to solve a problem. What they really wanna do is throw money at a problem and find a technology to enable it. And then when that ultimately does something and it's a nebulous outcome, then they go, ah, it was a great try. Well, what if you could check back and see iteratively how you're improving your processes? You can make a much stronger business case for the next project. Geez, you can even justify and, and track benefits and show the value of the work you've already done. So make sure you've got the, that piece in, of the puzzle in there as well. You wanna capture, you wanna model, you wanna deploy, and you want to operate and capture. Those are important parts at all levels of your process. So what is the value to this hybridized solution? First and foremost, we wanna uncover those process weaknesses with ERP configurations and other types of automation, like you know, heavy automation systems where we can do re-engineering. We also wanna evaluate the people who are executing the process. We can see that in our transactions through what we call interaction analysis, how people are touching process. We can also see this at the desktop level where people are executing processes at a very low level. We wanna provide a roadmap to understand what process transformation is going to look like. And that process transformation, when I say process transformation, I don't just mean, what are you gonna deploy in your ERP? I mean, how are you going to improve your business operation for the people doing it as well as the systems? Understand your SLAs, how are they being hit up against from a external supplier perspective and how are we helping our internal teams deliver on their promises to other teams I, I work with tons and tons of organizations where the biggest problem isn't the solutions that they're delivering from or getting delivered from their clients or vendors it's the people who are doing internal shared services who are not meeting the requirements and standards which are causing slowdowns and if you simply had better alignment of resources, more understandable expectations, uh, clearer goals and defined uh, steps to operation, and ultimately a better relationship between the business and automations, of course, you would be able to deliver and achieve your goals the way you'd expected them to be. And lastly, we wanna understand what are our low value activities? This is something that process mining is sometimes good at, but task mining is particularly good at. Um, and process mining says, this step is taking a long time. I'm suspicious of this step. There's some automation to it, but I don't understand why this transaction is not resolving more quickly. Well, there's a lot of low value activities happening underneath it. We wanna reveal those, emerge those up, contextualize those under the mind process, but be able to ultimately reduce or remove those so that you can get a better result and faster processes, more efficient processes, focus your time on what matters. So 
a lot of people are going to be theory crafting in this in this conference, and I love it. They're thought leaders. They, I, I I think they're fantastic at what they do, and I really want to learn, and I have been learning from their understanding and insights from the marketplace. Today in this session, I'm going to spend a lot of my time talking talking to you about exactly what actually happens and what specifically actually happened. I'm going to bring in an example of where I've done this specific work and why it was valuable and what we were able to get as an outcome from it. So today we're going to dive into a real example, a real execution of process and task mining put together. So what are some key deliverables and tasks for a hybridized approach? Number one, we want to understand what information you have. Existing documentation that will help to set a baseline for the expectations for process execution. And that could be systemized system documentation, so system specs or code, or you know, who, if, you're, if you have a big SI who's implemented something with you, they probably produced a lot of a lot of paperwork, being able to understand what they've got, what they said they were doing when they automated your processes. You're also bringing in your business processes, the strategy, the execution that was expected from your users, your people at a lower level, something you can compare to and fill these libraries of re with reusable assets. Next, we wanna do as part of these things is automatically create process models to start the conversation, a place within which you can have a conversation. To do that, we wanna bring the data from process mining, the data from task mining together and stack it top to bottom so we can understand here's our process, here's our tasks, how are we doing? Once we have this stack and we have our existing information, we now combine the two. What are we doing versus what do we think we should have done? Interesting, what are our variances? What's our non-compliances and how can we learn from some of the wisdom of the crowd? Worked for a fairly major oil and gas company in the South where they learned from the wisdom of the crowd that they shouldn't be doing a lot of the process steps that they mandated because the ones who weren't doing it were having a much faster throughput time and having the same outcomes. Well, let's take that lesson learned and use that to drive process improvement. We also wanna produce dashboards and visualizations to highlight KPIs and show where we're strong, where we're weak, and where we're suspicious. And particularly health checks on our, our suspicious processes and suspicious business units. Uh, for instance, if you've got a business unit consistently spending more time working on a particular process, why is that? Let's be able to go and investigate that, and it could be as a result of staffing issues, or it could be communications issues within that particular business unit. We could have a particularly a demographic of uh, orders or customers that are particularly difficult to end up going always to that business unit, as I had with one of my clients. It turns out that they weren't just slow, they just had all the worst customers. <laughs> and let's recommend something to make them better. Let's, let's figure out how we can do things better with them. So what's that real hybrid deployment? That, I, that I'm talking about, let's get some lessons and insights. Let's go straight into how we did it. So we, we, we pursued this and they, this, this is a, when one, of our, one of our clients said, I would like to do the following things. I wanna understand where I'm manually intervening in my automated process. That always tells me there's two levels here, right? There's the automation, the process mining, and then there's a manual work, that's the task mining. So where do I have to do things to intervene? And what am I doing when I intervene? And I want to reduce those. They, had, they said, we wanted to take away 20% of our process costs. That's an ambitious goal, and I'm for it. We're gonna make that happen. Number two is we wanted to make shorter wait times because people were waiting a long time for their orders to come through internally, and that was a serious issue. Um, we had, a, 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 that meant that the customers ended up being impacted, and we, have, uh, we, wanted, we wanted to have increase customer satisfaction, sort of increase that top line, and also decrease our customer complaints by 60% from those extra wait times or from incorrect orders and reworks that had to happen as a result of process weaknesses. I wanted to figure out, are our partners delivering on what they said they would do? So there were some serious issues they thought they had with vendors, but they couldn't identify them. They couldn't pick it out. Um, so that's process mining we're gonna pull in. We wanted to understand the satisfaction of end customers. We wanted to get those insights and bring them in. And that's when we start to talk about a, an ecosystem of data that comes in to inform where you should go. What, where does your NPS or your net promoter score factor into this? Well, now I'm gathering additional data on satisfaction and we can identify which processes from our process and task mining need to be focused on, which steps in our process mining, then which parts of our task mining and get that street level view. They wanted to create essentially a repository of documentation to help understand what they're doing, figure out how the users transact and how do we get improved work efficiencies by retraining, reprioritization, and ultimately implementation of a new way of doing, a new way of working. 
that greater transparency was really important to them. So this is a real client example. How do we do this? First and foremost, you focus on what processes you're gonna start with first. What's our most important thing? And we picked an order materials and service process. It's a common process, exists across a lot of organizations. They had a, you know, 10, 10 plus thousand executions a month, you know, somewhere between 18 and 20 steps in our transactional systems to be able to execute that process. Now they thought there was significant variance. They thought there was probably a lot of human touch because the cycle times are very long, but they couldn't identify exactly where and they couldn't identify why. So what are we doing? We import their content first. What do you have? Let's populate our repository with any existing information. And we were gonna leverage the BPMN, business process model and notation format in order to document and lay out the movement of information, particularly between systems, because that's where we're gonna catch that's those, those breakdowns. That's where we're gonna catch where manual rework, manual steps needed to be an intervener in there, as well as getting those contextual organization and system libraries. Then we ingested that data from a, a central processing system. There, they had a particularly had an ERP that was controlling a lot of the movement of their, of their information um, and, and rendered that data um, and mapped and matched it through keying. So helping to understand what step happened first, where it happened, and what, what process instance it fit into. And then evaluating all those things based on the, the KPIs and flow conformance, as in how are you compared to the documentation you provided and how are you compared to our overall expectations um, in terms of the delivery of these processes. And so we, we, we got down to the weeds there and made it clear, okay, here is what you're doing and here's what's going on. And so this is what we ended up getting. And this is, once again, these are, this is gonna give you a practical example, a practical approach to making it happen. So first and foremost, here's our process. This is what the process model looked like. The, here are the steps that we went, went into. This is the order in which they occurred. This was the documentation that they had, were able to provide. Not mind out, just the documentation. So what, where do we start? This is what we're trying to improve. This is, this is our nirvana. We're trying to achieve an optimized version of this order materials and services process. Next, let's mine this out. How is this process running? And you might imagine it didn't quite work the way that they expected. On the left side of the screen, you're seeing a bunch of loopbacks and variances and a whole whack of different things um, that, that people were doing to execute this. And there was a lot of rework. There was a lot of loop back. There was a lot of variant paths. Um, and we were able to filter down those dimensions by things that were important to them. Are people running this differently? Are suppliers running this differently? How does it happen as a result of characteristics we know we can control? And ultimately, what are the suspicious steps? Let's get into the things that are problematic. Where are, what, what steps are sticking out? And I say suspicious because we don't know for sure why these steps are the longest running. We don't have all that information. What we know is that these steps have manual touches and that they are taking a long time. And this is where we start to take a look at the lower level. We start to take a look at the dimensions that we're analyzing and we start to look at these task mining underneath these steps, which you'll see in a second. So where do we go next? And how do we look at this to get value from it? So we wanna understand what are our key candidates for change from just an individual step execution perspective. We're not talking about necessarily the whole system re-engineering. There is some, definitely some variance engineering we wanna get into and, and pull back so that you can have a more standard conformed process. But let's, let's see what, what we can use for task mining here. We also wanted to understand our people delivering, our suppliers delivering um, relative to what we wanted. So are we getting our KPIs? Are some, some of our suppliers problematic. We can pull that information out and help to understand why and where things are starting to break down. What are, what's our source of long-running processes that are, that are relying on external partners? And then where did things go wrong? And here's where we really dig in. Where are the individual steps that when executed took a time that was unacceptable? Things that were way above our KPI thresholds and things that were causing long-running process instances as a result of execution. Now that's really important to know because once again, we are saying these are suspicious. And when you're suspicious, it's time for you to take a look much more closely, figure out, hey, can we make this better? And how can we make this better? Now I group processes into four different quadrants when I take a look at these sorts of analyses. And it's really important um, that to, to go over this because I think this is a great metric and a great uh, structure for understanding where things can be improved and how they can be improved. Um, I group this on this chart 
which has a, two axes. The left axis or the, or the, the y axis is our frequency. Um, so how often does this process happen? And the x axis is, uh, is the, the amount of time it takes. Um, so we can, we can take a look at this process as how long does it take and how often does it happen? Um, obviously on the bottom left we have low value for improvement. Now, these are not really uh, things that are going to take uh, very much of a much. There's not, not a lot of value to these particular things. On the top right, we see automation as a big piece of the puzzle. And then, if you've got long-running processes that are taking um, that uh, that are you know these are things that are taking a long time. They don't happen that often. We want to make changes. We want to understand and and uh, build a better way of doing things. If you have processes, and that, that could involve things like RPA, that could involve things like learning and development. If you have processes that are very quick running, that uh, you know have uh, a lot of transactions that are occurring, but they don't take very long, you're gonna wanna do things like automation uh, improvement through that, trying to eke out small benefits through those particular things. And that's, that's really important to understand where you think you can do the best good. So where I'm finding things that are taking a long time, they, may not, they don't happen that often, but they take a long time. That's where we start to take a look at even more suspicious process steps, things we can get into in a task mining layer. So what do we learn at our process mining layer? We learned standards aren't being followed. We learned there's a lot of reworks and loopbacks. We, we learned where our more, most suspicious steps were and wh who was in violation of the SLAs and KPI thresholds that we have set and what our users at a high level are doing, uh, whether or not they're performing better or worse. And now we have the perfect case to head one layer deeper. Now let's now let's go down the rabbit hole into task mining. What processes are we actually executing? The one, the manual sub processes. Which ones are are suspicious based on those KPIs? How do we improve the individual execution? How do we capitalize on those learnings to support the implementation of new systems and technologies? Ultimately, the re-engineering of our process and the way we do things. So one step here. And you can see on, on the left side, one of those steps breaks into an entire sub-process. And you can see on those sub process it's a little bit small, but you can read that we're actually looking at the individual actions that are happening in Excel, Outlook in particular, as people navigate their emails in order to fill out the automated transactions we thought were so darn automated. Well, they're not. There's a ton of manual work that's going into this. And there's some loopbacks. There's some very different fail conditions. There's a lot of things we should be concerned about in this individual executor operation. Interesting. So, so how do we improve that? Where, where do we go into that? Well, let's take a look at what the actual flow of steps is for those people and what are the manual steps within this process that are taking the very longest. We've got times, it's a minute to minutes of time per, per step that we have to look at. If we could just do this in a, in a matter of seconds, we could save a huge amount because of the amount of, you know, the amount of time we're taking for each of these process steps to go through each of these parts of the process step. I can only imagine this, this transaction is actually, it's not taking 30, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours. No, no, the transaction is fast. The manual work is slow. And we actually dig into this and say, here's where, here is where the problem is at the task level. Reveal the flow of manual tasks, reveal what people need to change. It's not a process re-engineering or re-automation thing. It was actually all along a task level problem, people doing things differently. Let's use that data to drive the decision on how to improve. Don't just throw a bunch of money at the wall and hope that automation, re-automation in your big systems is gonna solve the problem. Understand that the automation in the big systems is being supplemented by work at the manual level where we can make a change, make a really big change for the better. And then how do we use this? Not only are we doing process re-engineering because we found where the problem was, we're also going to use this to create digital SOPs because one of the problems was conformance to process. So how do we make sure that people are doing it better the next time? So we need to bring this together with the documentation we've already spoken about, with the pre previous automations we've already spoken about, and now we're creating digital SOPs to support learning and development. In coordination with things like RPA, we wanna make sure that the people are taken care of at the very lowest level. And so that data helps the users to get better through job aids, through support for their ongoing operations. And in fact, a lot of our, the organizations we work with use modeling, use models and their, and their sort of a portal that comes along with them as a way of making people more informed, better prepared, and ultimately better able to execute on their processes. And then how does this data help our developers? We want to design, develop, and deploy. You design your automation landscape using simulation from the statistics captured through process and task mining. 
that hybrid approach of multiple levels. We want to simulate what's happening at each of these steps and where is it failing at the lower level if I were to make a certain change? What if I were to remove these steps? What if I were to set a new standard? What if I were to add an automation here that would reduce the time required? I can get that statistic and information in from my automation partner, and I can put that into the, the mix and understand what would the business benefit be from that. And then using that to, to, to send out requirements documents. Now you have, here's what I need from you, automation partner. Here's what I need from you, people, and who are executing this process. And I'm developing both a technical solution and I'm developing an organizational change solution, which I will deploy. Deploying that means both technically implementing and going live with your solution and also communicating and monitoring the act activities of your users. So design, develop, deploy based on the insights you've gathered at both of those levels. And what, what do we learn? Through that task mining layer, what do we learn? How, how do we dovetail that? The significant manual rework uh, our client was doing to support this automation, but it includes because it really wasn't fully in, in any sort of fa fashion or form automated. Um, we, we, we were great for helping to start the conversation about application rationalization, because once again, this automation had multiple different applications that were working on things and there was a lot of suspicious steps happening there. there was a ton of manual rework to fix automation problems that were happening in those larger systems. Why don't we rationalize that into something that is working? Let's look at the statistics on which processes and which systems are working better. Let's harmonize and, and, and go in on those in a big way. Next is we help to build the right way of re-engineering and automation through ERP configuration, as well as through manual rework um, or man manual uh, support through RPA and learning and development through standardizing processes, passing out training information, and being able to socialize that change, be part of that change management team. And we, we realized that inconsistent results and throughput times could be defeated. We could standardize, we could support, we could build, and we could ensure that the next way of doing things for this organization was better at both the task mining layer and at the process mining layer. In fact, they were kind of one and the same. They were part of one big model that we could put as a standard for how or the organization was going to execute things moving forward and ultimately be able to socialize and, and get acceptance for that, deploy that, and check back to make sure it was done. So what did we do? We actually got there. And in, in a very short amount of time, we were able to end up reducing those, you know, the, in, in, the, in the pilot stage of things, they were able to reduce the cost for execution in terms of human time, which was the biggest uh, issue for them, as well as they were able to rationalize a couple of the systems that they were working on that were definitely not value added, um, and be able to get that 20% number. They were starting to see substantially shorter wait times, even in the very first iteration of improvement um, through a, a very quick implementation of RPA to take some of those very suspicious steps and make them not quite so long running and, and bottleneck creating. Um, and then early on, people started to provide feedback, say, hey, this, was, this is fantastic. We love this. We're starting to see that, that customer acceptance of the new process and a better way of doing things. Um, we were able to go back out to their SLA partners and say, hey, listen, I found some issues that, that are happening as a result of the way in which you do business. You are doing business makes my doing business harder and that's not okay. Let's talk about how we can work together in the future. We were able to display and give them insight all the way up to the executive level of where things needed to get better, why they needed to get better. It's perfect, important, important thing for the business case development and project justification. Um, and then give control tower officers and folks who in the process ownership group visibility, street level visibility, what are the users were actually doing. We had, and had, people didn't even know who was doing what. Now they have this visibility, they have this documentation. They're ready, not just for this implementation, not, this, not just for this improvement, but for the future. They're ready for their future improvements at any level of implementation. And they can continuously monitor and use those lessons learned of where should I look, what should I do about it, to make their next way of doing things even stronger, even better, and build organizational capital around process and task mining hybridized to produce harmonized and benefits for the whole organization. And with that, I wanted to stop for questions and answers. Uh, I see my, uh, my time for the conversation has elapsed, but I wanna invite my friend Jose right back on the line because he and I are gonna have a great chat about what we've talked about today and also any other insights and thoughts you might have. 
Wow, what a great masterclass on the blending of process mining and task mining, a full picture of what's, uh, of what's needed. Um, the great examples, um, lots of positive feedback here on your presentation and, uh, and the insights, practical insights you have provided here. Um, there's a lot, all sorts of different types of questions, actually a, a very interesting variety of questions coming up. And uh, I am going to start here with uh, one related to privacy from all things. Oh, you know, yeah, task but... mining is looking at the user tasks at the desktop level. Uh, we have people here from all over the globe and they, they all have different perspectives on that and then how privacy is affected. And uh, uh, are, are these user actions protected by legislation such as G GDPR and others? But specifically is that how do you do the task mining without infringing on certain level of privacy that people want to have? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I would say every client I have asks that exact question because it's scary. You've got Big Brother on your computer. What are they doing? What are they looking at? Are they getting your password for your banking information? Oh no, that's terrible. Well, the truth of the matter is, is task mining just doesn't care about your banking information. It doesn't care about anything except for the performance of your work in the platforms that are supposed to be done for work. So what happens is task mining does two things. First is it does a lot of data masking, which is really good to ensure you're protecting the privacy of people from entering things like passwords and things like that that, that could be stolen and, and done and done ill with. The second thing is it, is it does data filtering um, and segmentation. So you never even capture in a task mining system anything about any system that is not in your very specific list. It's a pick list of things that you are going to look at because you have an understanding of what, how people are doing things and you can identify if you're missing something because there's like literally a, a block that's missing in a process. Hey, what, what happened during this huge empty space is black box. You can go and fix it. But normally we start with the very smallest you know, set of applications that you're going to look at. And that will usually give you a very good idea without infringing on anyone's privacy. When they're working on Word, Excel, Outlook, PowerPoint, these are things that are business applications for the purpose of completing business tasks. And that's where we're going to find the information we actually care about. And no other information will even be captured by the system. That is that that's good to know. Is the is that trigger at the application level? For example, uh, when you're using Excel, then then there's a trigger there. Then that. Uh, you're recording those tasks or it's on the whole time? How, how is that triggered? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little uh, desktop robot that sits in your, in your task bar and it is triggered by the execution of uh, or, or the call up of these particular uh, applications. So it's when you switch to the tab or switch to that program, it starts the recording process. Uh, when you open the program, it starts the recording process. And so, yes, it is at a desktop level that, 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 those, that, that that's made. You can do a secondary level of filtering and anonymization as it makes its way into a server that would chew this data up. So no human interacts with it before you get everything filtered and controlled to make sure that nothing comes through. Um, so there's, all, there's actually two levels of protection you build in. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great explanation. So, so thank you so much for that. Uh, the, the next question here has a little bit to do with governance, has to do with uh, the how do you identify and prioritize the right opportunities, hmm. knowing very well that it's not just about the business problem. It is about the business problem and uh, having the right group of people to work on that business problem. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about when you go into an organization, people say, oh, we, don't, we, you know, we have all sorts of problems, but I don't know which one would be good for process mining. What type mm -hmm. of things, what type of factors are you looking at to help your clients identify and prioritize potential applications that can create the most value and be successful in the implementation? Um, mm -hmm. What combination of, uh, of processes and people are you looking to bring together to tackle the issue? Yeah, it's a good question. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about processes first, then I'll talk about people. Processes is something that's going to be dependent on a conversation with, with people who are talking about strategic decision making for the organization. What are, are our core processes? What are we focusing on as part of the, the operations of our business that we think provides the highest value to us and to our customers? So what, what are the, what's the visibility of this process that I'm looking to target? And then what am I getting as feedback? Are, is this a process that is problematic? A perfect example, I worked for a very large bank up in Canada and they had a, a loan origination process that was really problematic. They had really low NPS 
the net, the net promoter score was, or the, or the business, business feedback, CSAPs were terrible. And they knew that there was a problem with the process because their customers were telling them there was a problem with the process. And so you can take a lot of these the sort of strategic business insights and be able to understand where you should look. What are our priorities and what is failing? Okay, cool. The third lever is a little bit more nebulous, is what can we affect? Um, and that's when we start to take a look at people. There are some business units that are very sort of structured and rigid. They're not going to change the way they do things. There's lots of lots of regulations that make so you have to do things in a certain way. And so there are so you are sort of adding to the bucket of things we care about and that matter. And you are taking from this bucket things we can't do anything about because there are factors that prevent us from doing so. And together, whatever you have left in that little bucket is going to be the things you should start targeting first. And you should start small and grow from there. Don't try and you know, evaluate your whole end-to-end -end business across 30 processes today. Don't do that. That's very that's, could be, that's a recipe for failure. But you start small and you grow from there. What, what's a, uh, usually an isolated process, so something that is, uh, has, has manual touches is very good to, because you want to bring both those levels in together. Um, and you, something that has visibility and in measurability. So for instance, a finance process or something like a supply chain process that does pass through a lot of different areas, but it's very measurable and it's within itself kind of. Um, those are those are good places to start to look. The people, on the other hand, you want to make sure you bring the right team together. So you want to have data scientists to understand your data. You want to have process engineers and business analysts to understand the context and how it fits into the way you flow things. And you want to have feedback from your executor community. Once again, I talked about the oil and gas opportunity. It is impossible to fully understand why a thing is happening if you don't talk to the people who are doing that thing. So having a digital collaboration platform, having feedback, having user interviews, having executor interviews, being able to see the, the, that together will give you more insight and context behind the work you're doing. And then ultimately, once you brought that team together to understand it, you've got those opinions, you wanna make, make sure you've got those executor buy-in. So when you choose to implement a solution, you can push it back out to them. And you're giving them the tools they need, as I talked about in one of those slides, I'm giving them the tools they need as job aids to be able to execute as per the new design so they can see the value of the feedback they've given and be involved in the process of improvement. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And this is also a good time, a very good answer and uh, this, uh, such great insights. Uh, a good time to remind the audience as well that Software AG has made some handouts available. You can check that out on the on the uh, webinar uh, um, window here to your right hand side under handouts, oh, yeah. and there are a number of uh, different uh, handouts available there that you can access and download right now. Um, um, JM, I have a I have a super interesting question here, very challenging, kind of unique question. This is coming from yeah. someone who works with C CMBS, which is commercial mortgage-backed securities in financial institutions. And one of the things that they have is that they have a lot of unstructured data. And uh, you know, every one of their contracts, you'd think that this mortgage-backed securities, they all kind of follow a standardized contract. Well, they don't. They have, every one of them has different types of contracts, yet some of the work and tasks are pretty common and they, they seem to, that they will lend themselves to automation. But there's a real struggle to automate because the contracts are not exactly the same, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, so I think the overall question here is that, uh, you know, any tips on how you deal with data that's a bit unstructured or there's a lot of variation on how, you know, contracts, for example, coming in? Is there an application where process mining and task mining can help or maybe that's not the right technology for that? Any suggestions on how to get a little bit better automation? on where there's a lot of variation contracts and perhaps unstructured data. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about there's, 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 there's two sort of challenges here. One is variation, second is the, is the data itself. So the variation variation is, is, a, is I get that. That's, that's, I, I, there is a lot of variation based on characteristics of client, based on the, pra the parameters of, of the particular security. I understand, I work with a, a lot of financial institutions where they bring the exact same up. Like, too much variation, how do I deal with this? Well, the answer is that's a process flow issue with characteristics of, of how it flows. So you're using flags and you're using different types um, to identify which process flow it should go under. That's already a process that actually is a, it's a thing. You're documenting it. You're just doing it in business rules inside your systems. That's okay. You can capture that as decision tables and you can capture that as variant process flows. Those are all fine. If you, in fact, we could have a process with a hundred different to a thousand different variants, doesn't matter, that is actually correct. And then honing in on each variant one at a time lets you get the granular analysis. So don't worry about 
the variation in the flow itself. Unstructured data is a different question. Um, I mean, by the way, the flow stuff can be very, very much, it can be automated based on the business rules and the decision tables you build. On the unstructured data, it's a different question. Um, so machine vision, which is what I'm talking about when we talk about task mining, is very good at understanding what, where you, what a click is and what it represents. The key here is that you need to understand all the different types of, the, of clicks that are the same click, at, uh, actually, that, that are the same, like this field here is the same as that field on this document, the same as this field on that document. So we are, what we're doing is we're keying in commonalities. And you know who knows that? Your people. Your, your business process executors already know that because they're making those decisions in their mind every time they look at a new uh, a new contract or a new securities document. They're, they're saying, oh, this field, oh, I recognize this field. It was that field on this other document. And so when you key in all the different possibilities and you use robotic process automation, you're setting, hey, RPA bot, go look on the screen to see if you can find one of these 35 different variations of the same field. Oh, you found it. Okay, put that little data field in there. Let's automate this process. Oh, other oh, okay, this other field, we found that over here. And so you can actually detect when you click on different places, you can even detect where those common fields are. So you use robotic process discovery in this task mining to understand the performance and execution, which will tell you what you should be automating in robotic process automation. And so use the plot, use the technology. To, to solve your problem on the discovery side, which will allow you to use the, te the, the technology to solve your problem on the execution side. Does that make sense? It makes total sense, JM. That's why you are one of my favorite presenters in all of the <laughs> sessions, because you get into the details, you get into the how to's, the, you know, what can be done, what's really challenging, real practical insights. Uh, we're gonna bring you back and have another session. We'll just have like a, yeah. a 45 minute Q and A with you on all of these challenges. I wanna say a shout out to the audience. I mean, we're having so yeah. many awesome questions provided by you, the practitioners who are watching this. So I promise you, we're gonna bring, we're gonna bring JM back in a future uh. session and we're gonna do another <laughs> another one of this. Uh, uh, maybe we'll do an even longer Q&A. Uh, yeah, a little that, fireside, Jose and JM. We, that's we, we, right, we, that's, that's right. The J and J here, and it's not an infringement <laughs> on Johnson Johnson, because I know there's a lot of our Johnson friends on this call right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> JM, what a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for sharing expertise and your wisdom. And it's obvious that our global audience appreciates uh, the the strategy and the tactics that you share with with the community. So thank, thank you, you so much friend. for being here with us. Pleasure, my friend. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a, a real industry leader and practitioner right there, J.M. Ellison with us and uh, always providing such great insights and uh, practical applications to process mining. We're going to wrap up the session now and uh, give you a break and we're going to restart at the top of the hour. And when we restart, we're going to bring a treat for you. We're going to bring a great leader from Twitter who is going to talk about process mining as a digital transformation accelerator. So that's Andre Kirkland, who is going to be joining us at the top of the hour. You do not want, do, do not want to miss Andre's session. And uh, I look forward to seeing you back soon here and the, the next 10 minutes or so. Thank you.